Today we're going to talk about the Jewish marriage and what that would look like in the first century and then discuss, discuss uh, the rapture and how those two things are tied together. Okay, so good. So this is, uh, the, you see the chupa there? There's uh, Jewish people being married and that's uh, the rapture. Are you excited about the rapture? Amen. Amen. So we, we need to keep our focus on that. There might be some interaction. I know you're maybe not used to that. Uh, I do that sometimes. It kind of freaks people out a little bit, but it's to keep you awake. If I see one sleeping in class, if you fall asleep, I'll make you do push-ups. But I won't, I won't, I, I promise I won't make you do that, but I might just uh, um, have some interaction with you and, and the audience. So the Jewish wedding customs and the rapture. Now, this is my, my girlfriend. She, she's still my girlfriend, but this is 1987. This is Beth. Uh, I went to Israel to go to graduate school. Uh, I, I arrived there in 86. This is standing on uh, where Mount Scopus is, uh, uh, Mount of Olives, looking down the Kidron Valley is behind her, and that's the eastern part of the eastern gate. Actually, the original eastern gate is probably is below that because it's everything you know builds up. I didn't know when I went to Israel that I would meet my future wife. That's not why I went. And, you know, I, but that was, that was great that I, I met her there in 87. She came for three weeks. We fell in love on the first date. You don't want to hear about that, though, so I'm going to move on. But there's a reason why I'm showing this. I, I like looking at her, but apart from that, there is a reason why I'm showing this. And then two years later, we got married in 89. That was her mom's dress. Her mom's with the Lord, so we'll see her someday. So this is the... This is, this is not a Jewish wedding, but these pictures, and then we got, that was a long time ago when my hair used to be dark, and now it's, uh, now it's a lot lighter, which is fine. So this passage that we're going to read, there's a lot of things in the Bible that if you don't understand the background of some of these passages, it's going to be confusing. And there's so many things. We could give so many examples, and I teach hermeneutics. We give a lot of examples of that. Because the Jewish people in the first century, they would have had understanding of their own culture. So we don't understand their culture. So sometimes we have to fill that in to make sure, you know, as the Gentiles that live in the 21st century uh, New Jersey, that we understand the background to some of these passages. It can be confusing. So when Jesus said this, anyone know when he said this? John 14. We have a number of key uh, uh, sermons that Christ did. We had the Sermon on the Mount, correct? Matthew 5 to 7. The Olivet Discourse, Matthew uh, 24 and 25. And then this one, the Upper Room, starts in John 13. This would have been Thursday night. So he would have died on Friday. Went through six trials, three civil trials, three religious trials. So this, would, this is Thursday night. And Peter had just said, I will never betray you, right? So here, when he said this, they would have been thinking of the Jewish marriage ceremony. Now, when we read this, I really doubt it. If you read this before, I'm sure this passage, did you ever think of the Jewish marriage ceremony? Unless you'd happen to read, read about this in, in a Arnold Fruchtenbaum, or he's, he's, a, he's a friend, Ariel Ministries, I encourage you to check out his teachings, and other, Gary Hedrick, who has some uh, articles too on this. Unless you read that, Typically, a Gentile in the 21st century wouldn't be thinking in your mind, would have this in your mind, the, the Jewish wedding. But that this would have been full in their minds, and it would have meant more to them than it does to us, which is why we're filling this in. And by the time we finish here, I want you to be so excited about the rapture. I want you just to be fill, you know, brimming to the full, the top of your head, you know, with this thought that it's 1025 right now, and one minute Christ could come back. And that, that should be filling our minds all the time. So we're going to read this, and then I'm going to talk about the Jewish marriage and, and, and tie this in with the rapture. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. And my Father's house are many mansions or dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself that where I am there you may be also, and where I go, you know, and the way you know.
Okay, so now we have uh, the Jewish custom. They would establish a marriage covenant. It's like the big picture. They're going to fill it in a little bit later on. So they would establish this uh, marriage covenant. Now, it's, I know it sounds strange to us that your parents would arrange for the marriage. Because when you're younger, you think your parents don't know anything, right? Your parents are, you think they're idiots. They are not. They are not. And when you get older and you get some wisdom as children, you understand that your parents are way smarter than you realize, and they probably would choose a much better spouse for, for people than, uh, than, than we would. In fact, I do a lot of uh, marriage counseling at Calvary Chapel. It's a pretty big church. And there's a number of people that really, if their parents had, had chosen their spouse, we wouldn't be doing marriage counseling because they, they, they didn't choose well, and they either they're, they're unequally yoked, all sorts of issues. So here, the, the parents would have established this, and the groom would take the initiative in this, and there would be a negotiation between uh, the groom and the bride's father. Now, this Jewish wedding system is still, was still used among the Jewish people until, this is Arnold Fruchtenbaum I mentioned this in one of his books, until the 20th century. Today, the system is used only by ultra-Orthodox and those who remain in some Eastern nations. And then we see this comparison between that and the rapture, that Jesus took the initiative through his incarnation, just like the man would take the initiative with this marriage, Jesus took the initiative through his incarnation and crucifixion. And then the bride would, declare, would be declared sanctified. And then the communion, which we did today, that's appropriate, we did communion today, that, that's this recurring symbol of the new covenant which we talked about. Now to fill in some details about this. Right, right. Okay, so next sign. Okay, so then the groom returned to his father's house. And then he would, uh, about a one-year separation. So all this is worked out by the, by the families, and the, the father would work this out with the, with the man, and they have this symbol, you know, they take the communion, and then there's a separation. So he goes back to his father's house. Think of John 14. For I go and prepare a place for you. So how long has he been gone? Almost 2,000 years. But in that culture, he'd be gone for about a year. Now, what was he doing? Well, they didn't, typically back then when you got married, you lived with your, with your family. You didn't move, you know, 1,000 miles away. And they expanded the father's house then to make room for, for hopefully kids coming, that the Lord would bless the family with kids. They'd make room for that. And then they would keep expanding. And then the, the bride would stay they back and gather her trousseau together. Now, what's a trousseau? I was preaching at one church, and there was a guy, um, I won't say which state it was, somewhere in the U.S., and he, he was falling asleep. And I mentioned his name. And I said, so if you don't know what a trousseau is, ask so-and-so afterwards. And he bolted from the chair because you know, he it woke him up. So, And he didn't hear anything before. He blah, 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 his name, and then he heard trousseau. And then what's that? So what's a trousseau? So the bride gathers her trousseau together. So she's, she's gathering the things she needs for the wedding night. We don't need to talk about that. But whatever the bride needs for that wedding night, she's, she's getting that ready. The man is back there preparing. So you, a normal situation, you would hope the bride is waiting for her groom. Now, does she know when he's coming back? No. She does not know when he's coming back. So she'd be excited about it. She'd go to the window and thinking, it would this be today? He's going to come today. He didn't come to maybe that day, but then she's just longing and she's yearning for that day. And she's hoping it's going to be made the next day. And then at some point, he would, he would come back. So then he's preparing a place for the bride. We talked about this. She gathers her trousseau, prepares for married life. And then, and then do the same way that the, the groom returned to his father's house. And Jesus was a carpenter, so you can imagine what a, what a more like a, a contractor, because the word carpenter in Greek really didn't mean what people think working with wood, but it's more of a general term. So that Jesus ascended to heaven, and now we had this separation during the church age. Now, the thing that's kind of a shame is a lot of people don't think about the rapture. They're not. And some churches never, this church is, is, is unique, and it's a biblical church. So this church going verse by verse, of course, here you're going to study the rapture. You're going to study 
27% of the Bible is prophecy. And we have prophecy that's been fulfilled already. About one-sixth of the Bible has not been fulfilled yet. But a lot of churches, my friend Andy Woods was doing, uh, he's in Sugarland Bible Church in Houston. He was about ready to do Revelation. And a lady came up to him and said, if you do Revelation, I'm going to leave your church. Because a lot of people don't, they don't like prophecy. And he said, well, I hope and pray that you find a church that's a lot better for you than, than Sugarland Bible Church. Because we will do Revelation. We, we do all the books. And he did spend about 60, I think a 60-part series on Revelation. It's wonderful. He's a, he's a good friend. So a lot of people have that attitude. Do you know there's a blessing in Revelation 1 for those that read the book of Revelation? So if you meet someone that they, they, they're thinking we shouldn't, you shouldn't do prophecy, why? Because it's divisive. Divisive. Well, I said to one person, well, how about the, because I had a pastor that said that to me. I said, isn't the gospel divisive? The last time I checked, the gospel is very divisive, isn't it? There's only one way to get to the Father and through Jesus. That's highly offensive to people. So does that mean that we shouldn't share the gospel because the gospel is very offensive? It's very div divisive? No, no. So do, and I asked a person, don't you want to be blessed at your church? Yes, no. Yeah, I want to be blessed. Well, let's read Revelation 1. I think it's Revelation 1, 3 together. And that says to the churches that they read this book, they'll be blessed. So the churches that aren't focusing on this, they're not going to be blessed. So it's really important that we focus on this. And this is not just about you having more knowledge about, about the rapture and about, okay, now you're going to know more about Jewish customs. And now you're going to know more about the rapture. That's important, right? That we, we need to... We need to uh, train up people, Ephesians 4. God gave gifts for that purpose, uh, you know, apostles and teachers, pastors and teachers. Um, God, you know, the foundation was laid with apostles and prophets, Ephesians 2.20. That foundation was laid, and we're built upon it. But then pastors are, you know, we train up people so that they are established in the faith. So it's not just about you are becoming smarter now. What is it about then? It's about the person's heart. Just so you get so excited about this upcoming event that this is good, this should change the way you live. So then now Jesus is preparing a, a dwelling place. The believers know that he's returning, and they're, we should be very motivated to stay pure in view of his imminent return. So just picture the groom going back for a year, and then the bride not being excited about, about, about this upcoming um, arrival of her groom. And then she meets another man, and then she's spending time with this other man. So when the, when the guy comes back to fetch her with his best friends, we'll talk about that later on, wouldn't that be a very sad situation that he comes back and then he knocks on the door and she's busy with another, she's occupied with another man. That is, that's an awful situation. So we want to make sure that we're not going that route as believers. We want to make sure that we're living the way we are right now so that if Jesus came back, we wouldn't be embarrassed. In fact, look at 1 John 2.28 just briefly. 1 John 2.28. So we talked about 1 John is written to believers. There's some people that misinterpret 1 John. This is not about, these aren't tests to determine if you're a believer or not, as some people wrongly say. This is written to believers, as we said before. This is about believers knowing how to establish this, uh, this uh, fellowship with the Father. So 2.28, John says, And now, little children, remember we said it's written to believers? He calls them brothers. He calls them little children. So that's evidence that he's writing believers. Abide in him. Why? Why should we abide in him? Well, it explains Keep reading. That when he appears, I think he's talking about the rapture there, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. If you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone who practices righteousness is born of him. And then in 3.2, he says, beloved, so he's writing believers, beloved. Now we are children of God. Another evidence he's writing believers, he calls children of God. And that is not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when he is revealed, 
we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. So why should we continue to abide in him? What does abiding mean? Remember, John was there when Christ did this uh, sermon, the, you know, the upper room discourse. So in John 15, he talks about remaining very close with the Father and this fellowship with the Father. And we don't, we, you know, we, we bear fruit. We don't produce fruit. And people think, I, th I thought we produced fruit. No, we don't. The Spirit does that through us. Our job is to remain close to, the, to Jesus in our relationship with him. And then so we make a decision to do that. But then the Spirit produces the fruit through us. And it's, I think it's similar to walking in the Spirit. If we walk in the Spirit, we have a choice to walk in the Spirit or walk according to the flesh. So we, we exhibit the fruit of the Spirit or Galatians 5, or we exhibit the fruit of the flesh, and we have a choice. So that's why we remain close to him, is that when our groom comes back, we're the bride, and we're looking out the window, when he comes back, that we're not embarrassed, the bride's not doing something very embarrassing. That we're he I'm here, and then she's in the middle of doing something that would be she would be ashamed of. So we need to think about that. So before we go down a certain path that could lead to destruction for a believer, we need to think about, if I continue doing that and uh, Jesus comes back, ask, ask myself the question, just apply this to myself, do I want to be doing that and having my groom catch me doing this in the middle of something? So before you go down a path, it's good to think about this. And a lot of people don't do that. So if, I, if I'm unfaithful to my wife, I think Randy Alcorn and other pastors have written all the, all the negative things that can happen like 10, 15 things, write them all out and have it, on a, have it on a piece of paper, really big, you know, font to where you start to go down a certain path, look at that, you know, see, ruin my family, ruin my ministry, all these ramifications of going down a certain path. So that's why we, we remain close to the, and we can't do it in our own strength, can we? Can you? Can you? No, none of us can. That's, that's a Romans 6, 7, 8, because Romans 7, Paul figured out, as strong as Paul's will was, it wasn't strong enough. And every time he saw the, about do not covet, he, he, he kept on failing. Because if, if, I, I like lifting weights. So if I took a five-pound weight, or even a three-pound weight, how long do you think I can hold it out like this? Not real long. I and mean, even a two-pound weight, after a while, you're... you're Shoulders start to ache because gravity is what it is. You know, gravity pulls things down. You might not like gravity, but it is what it is, right? You can't fight it. So that's this, this uh, demand that, that we have of to live righteously, but we can't do it in our own strength. You might think, well, I'm going to build my shoulders. I work my rotator cuff, work my shoulders more. I'm going to hold up longer. Yeah, you might be able to hold up 30 seconds longer, but you're still going to drop it. So what's the secret? There is, a, there is a law that's stronger than the law of gravity. It's called the law of displacement. So if you tie enough helium balloons to that weight, what happens to the weight? Five pounds becomes four pounds, three and a half. Keep on tying helium balloons to it, one pound, and then it can it'd be you know, zero. So what, what's the analogy? We go to the God and say, I can't do this. I keep on failing. I'm weak. So the secret to a victorious Christian life is not... Oh, I'm going to do better. I'm at a New Year's resolution. How long does that work? No sugar this year. No donuts. No bagels. Uh, I'm going to exercise every day. How's that working for you? You talk to someone on, June, on January 4th. So how's it going with your no sugar diet, no carbs? Uh, actually, on January 2nd, I, I ate a donut, and now I'm back to my... It doesn't work so well because you're trying to do that, and I try to do things my own strength. How many times do you see the Spirit in Romans 7? Look later on. How about Romans 8? Romans 8, he found the secret to a victorious Christian. What's the secret to a victorious Christian life? You don't need to buy a bunch of books. Just read Romans 6 to 8. Save your money, please. Is going to the Father and saying, I can't do this. I can't do it. I keep on failing. Galatians 2.20, he does it through you. Every time you go and say, I can't do this, I need you to help me, that's like tying a helium balloon to that weight. So that's a secret. So it's, it, the secret is abiding in him. It's walking in the spirit, and then he exhibits that fruit through you. It's not you bearing fruit. He bears, he, he does it. You know, we abide in him. 
remain close to him. So the believers should be very motivated to stay pure in view of uh, Jesus' imminent return. So you want to know what a first century, this is an actual picture, but this is the close we, we can get to what um, a first century Israelite house looked like. So the homes of poor families, that's right there, we're small and plain. By the way, send me an email if you want my PowerPoint presentation. I forgot to say that last week. My email is dbrewer. My name is David Brewer, like the Milwaukee Brewers without the S. So dbrewer at ccob.org. CCOB stands for, of course, Calvary Chapel Old Bridge. CCOB.org. Send me an email. Please send me your PowerPoint, and I'll be glad to share it with you. So the, the homes of poor families are very small and plain. They're built of rough stone or mud brick walls and roofs of wooden branches, woven branches, covered with clay. Living spaces were used for household work, cooking and weaving. Uh, at night, the family's domestic animals were housed in the lower level. So you see a comparison? First century houses were smaller than modern double-wide trailers and accommodated an entire family. See this, see this straw-covered roof? You can think of some passages where, uh, how about in, in Joshua, where Rahab, where she hid the spies? Where'd she hide them, remember? Underneath some flax? So you, if you think about the passage, you know, how about the guy that wanted to be healed and he went through, how, how did he do it? He couldn't get in the house. Too crowded. He went to the roof. I love that passage. I love, it. I love that guy. I can't wait to meet him someday. But, so you get maybe some images in your mind when you read different passages where they describe a house, you can get a little idea what the houses uh, look like. See the comparison? Not a very big Place. So 15 feet high, 24 by 24, a typical Israelite home. So when you read about, I'm going to prepare a place for you, you can have this in your mind, at least what, what we know based on archaeology, what the houses look like. In some parts of the world, the houses still look like that, even though, even though it's uh, like we have very modern homes here, but not in many places. So the procession, let's read about this procession. What, they would, what happened here is that the Jewish custom, the groom, usually came at night. So now it's time to fetch the bride. So it would be a torchlight uh, procession, and the shout would signal the groom's arrival. The groom would take the bride to his father's house where wedding guests are already gathered. And then here the Christ will descend with the shout in a blast of a trumpet. The souls of the dead church saints will descend with Christ, and both resurrected and chained church saints will meet Christ in the air. So the groom would travel from the father's house to the home of the prospective bride, and there he would negotiate with the father of the young uh, woman to determine the price he must pay to purchase her. Now going back and filling in some details. And then we said before, just to review, once the bridegroom paid the purchase price, then the marriage covenant was established. And then the young man and woman were regarded as husband and wife. Now, remember what happened to Joseph and Mary? They were considered husband and wife. And then, of course, Joseph found out about Mary. So that, 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 that was different than the betrothals today. And then from that moment on, the bride was considered to be consecrated or sanctified, set apart exclusively for her bridegroom. And then we talked about as a symbol of the covenant relationship, they drank from a cup of wine over which a betrothal benediction was, was pronounced. So this night, like the groom would come usually at night, torchlight procession, Christ in the same way will come back. So see when, when they read that, Pat, when they read those words to in John 14, what they would have been thinking about? And now that you know this, you can maybe you can uh, fill in those gaps that we have because we don't know the culture. So that before the bride's wedding ceremony, the bride was led to the mikvah. Now, have you heard that word before, the Hebrew word? The immersion pool for a ritual cleansing. And once she achieved ritual purity, the wedding ceremony could take place. 
And this corresponds to the believers judging for Christ. So we're going to be judged. And what are we judged on? Anyone know what we're judged on? Yeah, on our works. Now, we're not saved by works, are we? We're saved by faith alone. We're not saved by works. Now, would, would, does Christ have to give us rewards? And someone said one time to us, well, that's a little bit offensive to me, that we get rewards. And is it wrong to seek a reward? And another person said to me, I don't know if it's right for us to seek a reward. And I said, well, whose idea was it to have a reward? So anyone have kids here, raise kids? So did you have rewards for your kids? You're raising two hands. You had rewards for your kids? So whose idea is it when you have rewards for kids? Is it the kid's idea? Did the kids say, well, if I'm good, do, you, do I get this? No. You're not a parent. You're obviously not a parent. When you become a parent, you're going you're gonna to understand. It's not your idea. You, you, you don't come up with the reward. It's the parent's idea. So if the parent's idea is to give a reward, do they have to do that? No. But if they come up with that, is it wrong then that they, the child wants that reward? Let, let's say it's, it's Monday, and you say, if you're good this week, then I'm going to take you out for a special treat on Friday night. Now, is it wrong for that young girl or young boy to want the reward? No, because whose idea was it? And hopefully, you know, they want to spend time with their father or mother. They, they, want, to, they want to see their father or mother happy, smile when they've been obedient. So that's the analogy. It's not wrong to seek a reward because Christ is the one that came up with it. Does he, did he have to do that? And when we do Passover with, with the Jewish people and talking about the Jewish population, and we're, I, I witnessed them for many years, and I did a lot of Passover uh, seders, and we, sang a, we sing a song called Dainu. Dai, Dai, Enu. I won't sing it because you, you do a better job than I can do, but it's called Dainu. And it all goes, it, the way it's translated, it would have been enough. It would have been enough if God had done this. If he had just redeemed Israel, it, that would have been enough. That would have been sufficient. So it would have been enough, wouldn't it? Do you agree? If through faith in Jesus we get our sins forgiven. Wouldn't that have been enough? That instead of going to a literal lake of fire, now we're going to a glorious place beyond our comprehension. Wouldn't that have been enough? But he's done way more than that. So the song goes on and has all these verses on, if you would have just done this, that would have been sufficient or that would have been enough. But, but he's gone way above and beyond that. He's promised reward. So it's through our works and things that we do with the wrong, the wrong, with the right motive. If you do things to the wrong motive, because you know people are watching us, then that's, that's the wrong wrong thing. So we're going to be judged on the basis of that. And Mark Hitchcock has an example, Dr. Mark Hitchcock, of when the teacher gives an exam, people are fooling around a lot of times when, when, uh, when it, in school. Did you fool around in school? Yeah, you, we all did probably. So, but when the teacher says there's an exam coming, everyone's quiet now because they want to hear about the exam. And then if the teacher says to them, I'm going to give you the questions ahead of time. How did, how did you speak to each other? What motives and all these 10, 15 questions? Well, the New Testament has given us what we're going to be tested on. We shouldn't be surprised. It's, 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 it's very clear uh, on which so we have the questions ahead of time. So we should do well if you read the New Testament very clearly. So there's a, different, there's a distinction between our faith we receive eternal life. It's faith alone, not by works. But once you're saved, then we are going to be judged on the basis of works. Now, we don't end up in a lake of fire as believers, right? That's not the way it works. An unbeliever is judged, and that's Revelation 20, 11 to 15. That's a great white throne judgment. They end up in the lake of fire. But with us, it's a lot different. With us, it's rewards and loss of rewards. The Bible talks about losing a reward. There are some verses that, that talk about that. So we don't want to lose a reward. So see that distinction between salvation by faith alone and then, then above and beyond salvation, then we get a reward or we lose rewards. So this, that's a comparison that just as a bride would go to the mikvah, the submersion pool for ritual cleansing, 
And the same way we get judged before. And 1 Corinthians 3 talks about the fire is uh, our works are put through the fire. And you remember, you remember that passage of wood, hay, and stubble, and the gold, that, the gold and the precious stone that survived that fire, or the things we did for the wrong motive, whatever, those things, they, they don't survive. And I've, I've talked to some uh, Roman Catholics that use that for purgatory. And anyone who's been in my classes know, has heard me say that when you debate somebody, don't use a statement when you can ask a question. So the question I ask him, look at the passage, what's burned there in 1 Corinthians 3? That's like a free comment on the side. What, what, what's burn? The person? No, it's not the person. It's the works. The works are burned, not the person. So that, that's not purgatory. So if you ever get asked that, I'm on Bridge Bible Talk quite often. It's a live radio show that we have at Calvary Chapel. I was on it Friday. We get all sorts of questions, and we get some really interesting questions. That's, a, that's a, the, the fun of having a live radio show. And, but we get asked about this quite often, but it's an important one to keep, keep straight. Now, only a few people are invited to the ceremony, and normally the close friends and relatives of the bride and groom. So we have this marriage covenant worked out. The groom goes back, prepares a place, usually a year. The, 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 the bride is getting ready, who trousseau, and then before they go to the, you know, we had the, the fetching. Now it's time to fetch the bride. And then the, the bride goes through this mikvah, and then when they get back, there's a ceremony, and normally the close friends and relatives of the bride and groom are at this ceremony. Uh-oh, I'm going the wrong direction, I think. Let's see. Something happened there. Let's see. There we go. Okay, so the bride remains veiled during this ceremony. So after the groom fetches her, she goes back after the mikvah. She remains veiled. And the groom announces uh, consummation to the, way, the wed wedding party waiting outside. No, that sounds strange. So they consummate the marriage. And while they're doing that, people are celebrating. And the church is with Christ in heaven during the seven-year tribulation. Now, some people teach that the rapture is halfway through the tribulation or we're going to go through the tribulation. I think there's at least seven arguments how we know that the rapture is before the tribulation. I mean, the groom's not going to beat up on his bride. That's not the way, that's not the way it works. And that the purpose of the tribulation has nothing to do with the church. It's about pouring his wrath out upon an unbelieving world. And it's about backing Israel into a corner really tight so that God will use the tribulation, the trials of the tribulation. At the end, Israel then will believe. You know people on their deathbed, they were stubborn as a mule, but then on their deathbed, what do they do? Quite often, they finally are softened, and it might be just an hour or two, maybe a week before they die. But some people are really stubborn. So God's going to use the trials of the tribulation, and he can put the fire on the Jewish people. And, and I think the ones that are alive when Christ comes back, they're going to look upon the Messiah, Jesus, whom they pierced, Zechariah 12, and then place their faith in him. So then the, the, Christ, the church is with Christ in heaven during that seven-year tribulation, and usually they would have a, uh, the wedding for about a week, the ceremony for about a week. Imagine the money that would cost. John 2, what do you have? Remember John 2, 1 to 11, the wedding of Cana, and they run out of wine. That's very embarrassing when you run out of wine. So they went on for about a week. And this takes place after the judgment seat. So we talked about the judgment seat is first, and then, uh, then we're in, with Christ during the tribulation as he pours his wrath out upon an unbelieving world. Do you know in Revelation 6 to 18, what we don't see in those chapters? We don't see the church on the earth during, during those chapters. Interesting, isn't it? Now, we have tribulation saints. Those are people that become believers after the rapture and maybe as a result of the 144,000, and then they get martyred, but that's not the same thing as the church. The church, the bride, is with, in heaven. Again, the, the, the groom is not going to put his bride through that. He's not going to beat up on his bride when the marriage has barely started. That's not the way. And the, the Bible doesn't teach that at all. So then the groom brings out his bride. Now, after the, after the marriage is consummated, then the groom brings out his bride and removes her veil. The same way, after the seven-year tribulation, in Revelation 19, 
Last week, we talked about heaven is open. This expression, heaven is open, that's kind of mind-blowing, isn't it? Imagine looking at heaven and see like a door opening. Isn't that kind of mind-blowing? And some passages say that Christ is at the door. So Christ's return is imminent. That means it could happen any moment. So if you believe that the rapture is at toward the end of tribulation, can, you, can, can that person honestly say that the rapture is imminent? Do they believe that? Remember, we talked about asking questions. If you talk to someone that thinks that we're going to go through the tribulation, just say, so do you think the rapture could happen any moment? Yes or no? Let's say, it's, let's say you and I are talking, and you say, well, you think the ra- that we're going through the tribulation. If I say to you, well, do you think the rapture could happen any moment? If you say yes, you're speaking out of both sides of your mouth. I, I know you wouldn't. It's hypothetical. I know I can tease, tease you a little bit. So that person is speaking out of both sides of your mouth. Why is that? They don't truly believe that the rapture is imminent. They say that. It's not imminent because what, what has to happen before that, for that kind of theological viewpoint? That the whole tribulation has to happen first. But when it says that Christ is at the door, and all these, all these uh, passes we have, Philippians 4 and James 5, it says you and I should work out our problems with each other. Why? Because the judge is at the door. The judge is that he's getting ready to open the door at any moment. So that's, again, that's great motivation. So then after the seven-year tribulation, we return, Christ returns with his bride. And what are we riding on? Have you named your horse yet? Last week, we talked about that we're going to be on horses in Revelation 19 following Christ. In fact, if you look at Revelation 19 just for a minute, we have some time. This is an amazing passage. I want to get you really excited here. Now, Revelation 19, 11, this is the whole sermon, but I'll do it real briefly. Now I saw heaven open. Just like we have in Ezekiel 1, just like when, um, you know, Stephen looked up and what did he see? I think we talked about this last week before he, when he the first martyr. He saw heaven, I don't know if it says heaven open, but he saw Christ standing Ezekiel 1, heaven open, when Christ was baptized by John the Immerser, then we see heaven open. So here we see heaven open, and what did he see? A white horse, and it mentions the one sitting on him. His eyes are like a flame of fire, and it's mentioned his clothing. He was dipped, clothed with a robe dipped in blood. That's because when he comes back, his enemies dare to go against him, and he wipes out a bunch of them. That's why I think it's dipped in blood. In the armies in heaven, who are they? Clothed in fine linen, white and clean. Followed him on white horses. How many horses? A lot of them. It's like we could ask, so are there animals in heaven? Well, there's at least horses, right? And you know, you know where the all we talked about, we had a question on Bridge Bible Talk on Friday. Anyone know where the ultimate heaven is? Where is the ultimate heaven? Is it up here somewhere, wherever, a different dimension? On the earth. Because of the, the millennial reign, this is a messianic kingdom. We're not in the kingdom. We're not, people say we're building, no, we're, you're not building the kingdom. We're, we're not doing that. Where people are becoming believers, the church is being built. The kingdom isn't being built. The kingdom is, in one sense, God the Father reigns eternally from heaven, like some of the Psalms. But in another sense, it's Christ reigning on the earth for a thousand years. What's the next event now? Rapture. Then a future tribulation. This is not generic tribulation. We're not talking about just problems that go through, trials that go through. We all go through that, right? People have been martyred for 2,000 years. But we're talking about the tribulation that Revelation talks about. The believers don't go through that. Seven-year tribulation, the second half, really bad, the great tribulation, and then the second coming, believers following him. And after a 75-day period that Daniel talks about, 12, then we have the millennium starting. What's that? Fancy word for Christ reigning bodily, literally, on David's throne on the earth with believers helping him reign. 
So really, how you act now, how faithful you are now, again, we're saved by faith, not, not by works, but the level that you're reigning in the millennium, this is offensive to some people, but so be it. This is what the Bible teaches. The level that you're reigning is really how you act now with what you did with, with what God gave you, right? That's, that's, and people think we're all going to be like participation trophies. But now, you know, people, when I was younger, I, I was born 61. When I was younger, the first place got what kind of ribbon? Yeah, in the second place, now that's offensive. Now everyone gets a participation. You don't want to hurt people's feelings, right? That if you get fourth place, you don't want to hurt their delicate feelings so then everyone gets the same. But that's not the way God does. Everyone's the same in that we all get saved. Through faith in him, we get our sins forgiven. We all end up in heaven. But it's not the same. There are different degrees in hell. And there's a lot of passages that talk about that. And there are degrees really within heaven. So we reign with Christ for a thousand years. That's really the, that's the, the, the kingdom that's coming. The first part of the kingdom is on the earth. And then after Satan gets thrown in the lake of fire, amen, and his demons, unbelievers are judged. What comes after that? The eternal state. So the last two chapters of the Bible, Revelation 21 and 22, we finally get back to the way it was with the first two chapters. So how many chapters in the Bible? We have a perfect situation. Four. Genesis 1 and 2, the fall in Genesis 3. So from Genesis 3 all the way to Revelation 20, verse 15, that's the last verse about the great white throne judgment when the unbelievers get judged and thrown in the lake of fire. In perfect situation. And finally, in Revelation 21, he recreates the heavens and earth. We have a new, a mind-blowing city called the New Jerusalem. So there's two parts of the kingdom. It's on the earth. It's a thousand-year reign. And then it's the eternal state. So that's the kingdom. It's a lot to look forward to. So we're gonna, you're going to follow him on horses. So if you look at Revelation 19, it says the armies in heaven are clothed in fine linen, white and clean. Now, when you teach hermeneutics, we talk about the Bible interpreting itself. The Bible is the best interpreter of the Bible, not me. The Bible is. Look back at verse 7. Go back seven verses from verse 14 to verse 7, Revelation 19, 7. Let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory. Why? For the marriage of the Lamb has come. We talked about marriage. See all the symbolism here, if you know the Jewish uh, marriage? And his wife has made herself ready. Who's the wife? Who's the wife of the lamb? Yeah, the church, the universal church. And to her, it was granted to be arrayed, to be clothed in fine linen. Does that sound familiar? Anybody? Verse 8. Clean and bright, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. So she's already been judged. The bride has been judged. Again, very different from an unbeliever's judgment. The believer's judgment doesn't result in condemnation. It results in rewards, just to reiterate, loss of rewards. So this is, she's dressed in white because she's already been judged. And so make a, draw a line, if you don't mind writing your Bibles, from 8 to 14. That's how we know that verse 14, the armies in heaven on horses, that's the bride right there. And then a sharp sword comes out of his mouth. In verse 16, he has his, on his robe, and on his thigh, a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. So that's our groom. And uh, the unbelievers that go against him, he's going to speak one word, two words, drop dead. When Christ says drop dead, you drop dead. And he's going to speak one word. He, he, he created the universe with one word. That God the Father created through him, John 1, it teaches so Christ will speak a word, and then people will die. A lot of people will die. So this is the second coming, and believers are behind him. So here, after the seven-year tribulation, Christ returns with his bride to reveal to the world who she is. And Zechariah 12 describes the same event as Revelation 19. If we had time, we could in class, we put them all together, all these passages together into one harmonious picture that Zechariah 12 describes all these nations coming against Israel. 
and then it looks really bad for her. Revelation, Zechariah 12 and 14, and then the warrior comes back just in time in Zechariah 14, same as Revelation 19, and delivers Israel. And even, even Zechariah 14 says, and the warrior comes back, Christ comes back, and his holy ones with him. Isn't that really cool how Zechariah 14 harmonized with Revelation 19? And his holy ones with him. And we know from Revelation 19, who are those holy ones with him? The bride on horses. And other passages teach that the angels come back with them too. How many angels are there? What a huge number that is. All the angels and, and the bride coming with him. Are you excited yes. to learn about this? So the marriage feast, now we talked about this in verse 9. Go back to verse 9. This will be in a different place in the marriage ceremony since many are invited to come to this feast. The Old Testament saints aren't resurrected until the end of the tribulation because the different people resurrect at different times. When do we receive our new body, the church? Anyone know? At the rapture. And those of you who are young, don't think you need a new body. But those of us who are older, maybe over 50 or 40, I'm definitely over 50, I'm 59. Uh, we're excited about new body. We're looking forward to that. So we get our new bodies at the rapture. And some other people don't get their resurrected until after the tribulation. So John the Immerser was a friend of the bridegroom. Remember that verse in John 3? He's a friend of the bridegroom. And he didn't consider himself to be a member of the bride of the Messiah, the church. So the many who are invited to attend the marriage supper on earth are all the Old Testament saints in the tribulation saints resurrected after Jesus' second coming. So this is different than this is different stages of the wedding then. We have the working out with the father, and then you, you work out the bride price, they take the cup and they celebrate, and now they're considered husband and wife, even though they haven't come together physically yet. Then they're separated. And then the groom comes back, the bride is ready, she, gets it, she cleanses herself, goes back, and while they're partying, they consummate the marriage, and then, they sell, and then they announce that they consummate the marriage, and then she takes her veil off, he introduces her to everybody, and after that, and that's symbolic of the second coming, you know, picture of that, and then now this feast comes after that. So the marriage ceremony will occur in heaven just before the second coming, because like, like they celebrate for seven days, we're with Christ in heaven during seven years, during the tribulation. That's the future tribulation. will take place on earth after the second coming, and this feast might begin the millennium. And we have some passages in Matthew to des describe weddings. So the Jewish people were very familiar with that whole that type of thinking. So the description of the rapture, we've talked about this uh, Jewish marriage and compare it to the rapture. The first event is Christ will descend with a shout and a blast of a trumpet. So we're listening for a shout in a, in, a, in a trumpet blast from the Father's house in heaven to the air above the earth. Now some people merge would say the rapture and the second coming is one event. There's at least 14 or 15 differences between them. They're not the same event at all. And it's separated by at least seven years. So the rapture first, second coming over here. What's in between? Seven-year tribulation. And we have 19 judgments in Revelation. And then the souls went back too far. Try this again. So the souls of dead church saints will descend from heaven with Christ that is coming. When these church saints died... Their souls left their bodies and went to be with the Lord in heaven. So your grandparents and possibly other loved ones that are gone on, they're with the Lord, and their bodies are in the ground, and they'll be reunited at some point. So the bodies of the dead church saints will be raised as immortal, incorruptible bodies, and we be reunited with their returning souls. And then the bodies of church saints who have not died before this coming of Christ will be changed instantly into immortal, incorruptible bodies. So a number of passages teach that, that will get changed right away, immediately. That's, that's completely mind-blowing, isn't it? So we're excited about that. 
And then both the resurrected and chained church, saint, church saints will be caught up together to meet Christ in the air. And then we'll be with him for all eternity then. Well, that's sensitive. <laughs> Try this again. I push it a little too hard and then it goes a little too fast. And then both the resurrected will be caught to meet him in the air. Did that. And then the church saints will return with Christ to his father's house in heaven to dwell with him in indescribable living accommodations that he has prepared there for him. He's been preparing for 2,000 years. And you can read about the, the new Jerusalem in Revelation 21 and 22. It's really an incredible place. So in view of his imminent return, we should be motivated to holy living. We talked about that. We should be encouraged to establish biblical priorities and see what is most important. In view of the fact that he could come back at any moment, that should help us with our priorities. Live life with a continual awareness of future realities, plus it can help you with depression. Because you start focusing on all these depressing things in the news. It's wrong focus. We need to focus on things above it's not that you're not aware of what things are going on. You know, we can be aware of it. But if you focus too much on those things, you get really... Are you the same with you guys? I can only speak for myself. I just know if I overdwell on things I can't change, then I get, I get depressed, I get excited, too excited. But you think about this, and you get excited in a good way because you can't wait to see Jesus. Change what we do with our time, money, and resources and we're going to be judged on that someday by Christ. So that's important anyway. Have hope and comfort in our sorrow. Do you have sorrow right now? Have you lost a loved one? Some people are losing jobs. Some people are depressed. I think mean, that's good to, to think more about this. And be active in evangelism and service. We don't want our worst enemy to go to the lake of fire. So that, that should give us a lot of motivation to witness to those around us that, that he's put in your path, whether you're at work or you're your neighborhoods, because you can, you can touch people in ways that no, I can't, that you're, you're surrounded by, by people that need the Lord, and, and he can give you wisdom to, to know how to share the, uh, the gospel with people. So the gospel, if people are listening, or anyone here not a believer, really important that they think about what the gospel is, the good news about Christ, God's holy standards, we all fall short, sinful, we're all... Before we become believers, we're sinful, we're guilty, we deserve death. Don't we all deserve to be in the lake of fire? I do. But then sin is what it separates us from a holy, righteous, just God. But then through Christ, he's paid our sins in full. And then we can go to heaven instead of going to... So we have this great exchange we talked about last week. I was talking about Isaiah 53. He, puts our, he takes our sin from us upon himself. In exchange, he gives us his, his righteousness. We talked about that verse in Isaiah 53. By his knowledge, he will justify many. It's knowledge that we have of him, the people that place their faith in Jesus. In exchange, we receive righteousness. So that's a great exchange. So the gospel is a good news of Christ's complete provision for salvation to eternal life which is ours when we believe that Jesus, being fully God and fully man, died on the cross and rose from the dead to pay the penalty for the sin that we deserve, conquering the sting of death for those who place their faith rather than their own works in his finished work on the cross. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you so much for this great truth that we have in the Bible, this uh, Jewish marriage ceremony. And we're so excited about seeing you someday. Thank you for dying for us. Thank you we can celebrate today your, your communion, what you did for us uh, with the bread and the and uh, juice. Um, so thank you for uh, that suffering you went through. We look forward to seeing you someday. Help us to be faithful with the gifts you've given us. We would give you glory. And just encourage people here that are going through difficult things, tough, tough situations with their health maybe jobs or lack of jobs, loved ones that are sick, you would just comfort them with these truths. You're going to come back someday and make everything new. In Jesus' matchless name we pray. Amen. Amen.